You guys want to keep going? You want to keep going? Keep going! If you guys haven't heard already in my voice, um, I'm, I'm very proud to be here and very proud to do the special here. And um, uh, after, ton after tonight, um, I'm going to be off of doing stand-up for about a month and a half. And then I get to start all over again and work on a new special. Um, this one took about three, four years. I probably should have put it out sooner, but uh, <laughs> I'm lazy. <laughs> I got to tell you guys. Being a comedian has been the, uh, one of the greatest experiences for me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride. It's been a fun ride, and um, a lot of people don't understand what has gone into this. You know, uh, me personally, I, I got a lot of people to thank. My family, obviously, first and foremost, and all my friends and all the support and all the people you don't see that are behind the scenes that have helped me. You know, there's a lot of comedians out there. They do really good, and for some reason, they start, you know, going crazy, and things happen, and then what happened? <laughs> Wrong people around them. So whenever you see me, you're like, oh, Gabriel's keeping it together. Because people keep me together. Shoot, I start believing my own hype. I'm at 7-Eleven. Yeah, give me all that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Give me slurping. Give me crazy. <laughs> Why is he talking to me like that? I don't know. Just, you know I just want you guys to know. <laughs> it's been a fun ride. And I, I want you to understand a little bit more of what has happened over the years to get to this point. For the first, I'd say the first 10 years of my career... I was considered a Southwest comedian by promoters, meaning that they would only promote me in California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, you know, New Mexico. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing is that they were calling me a Southwest comedian and then they call me Latino comedian. And I hated that. No, no woo, I hate that. <laughs> I'll tell you why. And I know you have good intentions when you woo. Let me explain why I don't like that title. When you say Latino comedian, it makes it sound like I can only perform for Latinos, okay? And don't get me wrong, I know who I am and where I come from, but I believe that Latinos should be shared with everyone, and that's what I'm trying to do. And the reason why I make a big deal about that is because anybody else, you just call them their name. For example, Jerry Seinfeld. He's just Jerry Seinfeld. He's not Jewish comedian Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> Chris Rock is just Chris Rock. He's not African-American comedian Chris Rock. But with me, I was always Latino comedian or fat comic. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't even call me Fluffy, those bastards. <laughs> and so it wasn't until years and years of grinding it out that eventually I wound up meeting a promoter who eventually became my manager who took a chance on me and he promoted me in Minneapolis, Minnesota, okay? And you cannot get any whiter than Minneapolis, Minnesota. That is where the Howleys are built, okay? That is the Howley factory, okay? It's Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it was a venue about as big as this, and it was, uh, it was sold out. And word got back to Los Angeles and to New York and to all these promoters that there's this entertainer with the last name Iglesias who sold a bunch of tickets who was not Enrique. <laughs> Next thing you know, promoters are coming out the woodwork. Now they're changing their tune. Now they're not calling me Latino comedian anymore. Now they're saying, oh, this guy's he's funny across the board. He's crossover. He's so crossover. His material touches everyone. He's crossover. He's crossover. Really? You're going to call a Mexican crossover? <laughs> It was getting worse! All I wanted to do was be given a chance to go out and perform and show what I could do and not have restrictions and titles and stuff put on. And it was very, very hard. And so, like I said, once I met my, uh, my, my buddy who took care of me and became my manager, Joe Melange, did amazing work, he started taking me everywhere. And with the help of him and my, my agent, uh, Matt Blake, and Comedy Central started backing me up, and we wound up hitting all 50 states. Next thing I know, we go to Canada. Next thing I know, they sent me to Europe. Next thing I know, we hit Australia. And then I get this phone call. My agent calls me up and he says, Gabe, check it out. You're getting a request to perform in the Middle East. I go, really? Okay, cool. Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, who? Actually, the request is coming from a prince. Run that by me again. A prince. I said, purple rain? 
not Prince. A Prince. I said, how do they know me? I, I, I don't know, but they say that they know you and they want to hire you. I go, it sounds like a joke, Matt. Trust me, it sounds legit. All right. If it's legit, I'll tell you what. Give whoever a ridiculous figure and let them know that they have to wire the money today. Otherwise, forget it. Four hours later, Gabe, what? Ridiculous just called. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm looking at the screen, bro. They wired all of it. Next thing I know. <sighs> Welcome aboard Saudi Arabian Airlines. <laughs> Seventeen hour flight you guys from Detroit, Michigan to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia And just so you guys know, I didn't go by myself, okay? I took some friends with me Nobody from this show <laughs> So I took two other friends, I took one friend, his name is Edwin San Juan, who's Filipino, works clean Oh yeah, and another buddy of mine named Larry Omaha, who's Native American, who also works clean. And, uh, all right, so, hell yeah, sure. <laughs> Hold on, I want to look at the camera. Hey, Larry Omaha, Edwin San Juan, you guys have fans and they're here in Hawaii. Get your asses over here. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we head to Riyadh, 17 hour flight from Detroit. As soon as we get there, they flew us their first class, by the way, it was really nice. And the plane is pulling up to the gate and you know, it's doing the whole, you know, and the tube is coming out to meet the plane. As soon as the tube touches the plane, all of a sudden, the door on the opposite side of the plane pops open and a man in a suit gets on and he walks over to the three of us and he does this. And I'm sitting there freaking out like, oh my God, this is like the movies. And they pulled us off the plane and they escorted us to this area called VIP baggage claim. And it sounds kind of crazy, VIP, and I get there and I realize, oh, they're, they're serving cookies and candy and coffee and there's leather sofas and it's really nice. And there's nothing but Middle Eastern businessmen there, okay? And they're all talking about me. I don't understand Arabic, but everyone in this room understands when someone's talking about you. The guy's looking at me and he's like, I'm sorry, but this is universal. And apparently this is Arabic for DAMN! <laughs> so then this other guy walks over to me and he's holding a sign and the sign has my name on it and he's really excited. He's like, it is you, come, 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 it is you, come, come, come we go. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So we grab our luggage and we follow him outside to the curb. They have three Lincoln Navigator SUVs waiting for us. There's three comedians and there's three cars. We're so paranoid that we're in the Middle East, we all get in one car. <laughs> we're sitting in there. <laughs> and we take off. We're heading towards downtown Riyadh, okay? Now, all I know up to this point about my experience is that I've already been paid, my flight's been taken care of, and I have a point person who I'm supposed to meet at the airport who's not there. So I'm talking to the driver, I said, excuse me, sir, where's, where's, where's this guy? It is okay, hey, take you to him, he's, he's okay, he's okay, he's okay. Uh, uh, okay, and for me it's not okay because I researched Saudi Arabia and you know, you think the rules in Singapore are strict. <laughs> the rules in Saudi Arabia are very, very different, okay? And I don't want to offend anyone and I want to make sure that I don't say the wrong thing. So I need to know, you know, some, some, I need some info. So I keep talking to the driver, I said, um, sir, would you mind helping me with some questions? Whatever you need, you ask, I tell you, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, I apologize in advance if I come across rude or disrespectful or ignorant, but um, how do you guys know about me here in the Middle East? What do you mean, how do we know? Yeah, how do you know that I'm a comedian? Do you have Comedy Central or HBO or Showtime? What is that? That's a no, that's what that is, that's a no. Um, how do you know that I'm an entertainer? Your videos, YouTube, my friend, YouTube, you're huge. You're the number two most famous comedian in all of the Middle East. Number two. You're kidding. I am not comedian. I don't kid. <laughs> no. I'm the number two most famous comedian in all of the Middle East? Yes. Who's number one? Jeff Dunham. <laughs> Jeff
Jeff Dunham is the number one comedian in the Middle East. You guys don't find him at all offensive? Oh, <gasps> no. I kill you. When I heard that, you guys, I was like, you know what? They get it. They get it. So I'm like, we're cool. We're sitting, we're driving, we're heading towards downtown. All of a sudden, the driver cuts the wheel really hard, and we get off the freeway, and now we're taking a side road going away from the city. And I'm like, um, excuse me, where are we going? We're going to the show. I go, um, it says here that we're staying in the city. Yes, you're staying in the city, but the show is somewhere else. That doesn't make sense. Why would you have the show somewhere else? How come you don't have it in the city? And then he broke it down. My friend. Here in Riyadh, it is very different, okay? Uh, your type of entertainment is forbidden in the city. There are people called religious police that hold up the uh, traditions. They keep it so that it's very traditional. It is not allowed. The social gathering is a no-no. We must go somewhere secret in the desert. <laughs> uh, all right, um... So how many people are you guys expecting at the show? Easily between seven to eight hundred people. That many? I told you. Number two. <laughs> and sure enough, you guys, we pull up to this racetrack in the middle of the desert. And there's a, there's a giant tent set up next to it. And there's, there's 800 people, roughly, there for a comedy show. And as soon as we pull up, as soon as we pull up, <laughs> radios start popping out. Just right. <laughs> And I keep hearing on all the radios, fluffy, 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 fluffy. All of a sudden, some guy runs up on the stage and they hand him a microphone and he starts yelling to the crowd. I don't know what he's saying, but I've seen enough hip hop to recognize a hype man. Oh yeah, he's out there. And then I get the biggest introduction of my life. And now, direct from the United States of America, here he is, Gabriel Iglesias. And the crowd starts going, fluffy, fluffy, fluffy. And when I heard that, I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be an amazing show. So I ran to the stage as fast as I could. I'm not a runner. I booked it to the stage, you guys, because I was so excited. And when I got to the front, it clicked that in Saudi Arabia, they still have segregation. And I didn't find out till the last second because I saw a line going down the middle. And on one side, men. Other side, women. And all the women in the front row were covered from head to toe. All I saw was this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had no idea I was performing for Assassin's Creed. I didn't know that. <laughs> The Saudis had such an amazing sense of humor. They were laughing and carrying on, and I had no idea they were going to be like that. And then after the show, I got a chance to meet some of the locals. And one guy was almost in tears. He was so emotional. He walks up to me, and he's just like, <laughs> I cannot believe that I am standing here in front of you, Mr. Fluffy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Please. Please, when you return to United States or wherever you travel, let the people know what you saw, okay? Let them know that we are not all bad, that we are not all those bad people from Fox News, okay? <laughs> you let them know, because we see Fox News, and Fox News believes that everybody in Middle East is bad, everybody's terrorist, everybody has a bomb, he has a bomb, he has a bomb, he has a bomb. Oprah is here giving away bombs to everybody, everybody... <laughs> Please, you let them know. We are not all bad people, okay? We are not all terrorists. My cousin. Maybe. What? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Look at your face. Look at your face. Oh, I'm going to die. Look at you. <laughs> A plane. What plane? I got you again. Two for two, I got you. He is raising my blood pressure every seven seconds. 
And then he starts breaking it down for me how stand-up comedy is starting to bring people together in the Middle East. And how he's starting to, do, you know, he's doing comedy. It's, it was crazy, the conversation. You know, here in, the, in Saudi Arabia, um, uh, people, they, they like uh, watching the, the stand-up comedy because uh, we love to laugh. Okay, we love to laugh. It's great to laugh. And uh, people don't think that uh, people in the Middle East have sense of humor. They, they see videos, they see TV, they think we are the same. They say, oh, in Middle Eastern people are all angry. Look at their face, they're angry. Everybody angry, everybody mad, everybody angry. My friend, we're not angry. It's hot. Okay, it's 117 degrees. Everybody is not mad, they're hot. Look at everybody has a hot face. Hot face. Everybody hot face. I promise you give me air conditioning. I am so happy. <laughs> we are okay. We love to laugh. I've been doing the stand up comedy for uh, about uh, six months now, and um, I have jokes. Good for you. May I try? Oh, great. <laughs> All right, man, go ahead. Okay, very nervous, very nervous. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Two Jews walk into a bar. Not in my country. Hey, man, you're gonna get my ass arrested, bro. <laughs> We wound up doing shows all over the Middle East. We were in uh, Riyadh, Bahrain, Dubai, Qatar, Doha, and each show, you guys, was more amazing than the last show. Not because there were so many people, but because the people were friendly. They were fun, they got all the references. I couldn't get over that. I honestly thought that they were gonna be like the people from Fox News. <laughs> And I felt terrible. I felt terrible because I was judging them. I was prejudging them and I thought that they were gonna be a certain way and I felt bad because all those years people were doing that to me, not really giving me a chance and I was over there doing the same thing. I felt so bad. And then when I met the prince, I was still judging. 19 years old and he's a prince. I thought he was gonna be a brat. He walks up to me and I was already like, what's up? <laughs> I failed to realize that he's a prince and he was brought up to be a prince. The way he carried himself, he intimidated me in about 18 seconds. Okay, I'm 36. And I'm, you know, what's up? And he's like, Jibril. Excuse me? Jibril. Jibril? Gabriel. I understand that your name is Gabriel, but in the Arabic language, your name is Jibril. I was welcoming you in our language. Oh! I'm a dick. And I started already imagining what was going to happen. I'm like, ah! I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he was so nice, you guys. He's like, I want to thank you for coming here to Riyadh and doing all of these shows. It was so beautiful to see everyone having such an amazing time, from the little children in attendance, all the way to the elderly people with a cane. Everyone had an amazing time, everyone. It was beautiful, okay, beautiful. Religious people laughing. Religious police laughing. <laughs> they don't laugh at <laughs> I want you to understand how big this is. There was an American here entertaining people from Middle East. There was no violence, no bloodshed, no problems. Everybody was smiling. Everybody was getting along. It is possible. An American was here. An American was here. He kept saying American, American, American. Freaking 10 years being called a Latino comic. I had to go all the way around the world to finally get called American. <laughs> And then I had the most surreal conversation I have ever had with the person. He looks at me and he says, I want to thank you for everything. I want to invite you and your friends to come to my palace so that I may entertain you. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I am not getting invited to a palace by a prince. Oh my God, up until this point, my only experience with royalty was a Burger King drive through <laughs> All of a sudden, one of those SUVs pulls up. 
and a guy jumps out in a suit, and I guess his favorite word was please, because that's all he said. Please. 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 I'm like, are you kidding me? There's a man in a suit trying to get me in the back of a Lincoln Navigator, and there's a prince inviting me to his palace. I'm not going to lie. I felt like a hot chick. I didn't know. I was like, oh my God, let's go. We get to the front of his palace, you guys. I'm not gonna lie, it didn't look like a palace. The walls are really high, there's barbed wire around the entire property, and there's two guys in the front with machine guns. I'm looking at this and I'm like, this doesn't look like a palace. <laughs> and I started thinking, what if I'm on some messed up episode of Middle Eastern punk? You know what I mean? Like, you thought you go to palace, you go to prison, you're punk! You're Fortunately, the doors opened up and we drive in and then they closed and when we got outside you guys what we saw was amazing Outside desert inside palm trees bushes shrubs a pond and he had exotic pets I know exotic pets because I know what I have <laughs> Over there And he had a freaking boa constrictor. I'm like, are you kidding me? Snakes, monkeys, a zebra, and a tiger? Oh my God, that makes me Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> and I started thinking, what if he decides to keep me? It sounds messed up, but let me explain. As an American, you cannot just purchase an airline ticket to go to Saudi Arabia. You have to be invited by a person of power. You know, when I left Detroit to go over there, I had to fill out a form that says, I understand that I'm going to Saudi Arabia. And should something happen to me, one of those things on the list being kidnapping, conveniently right above death, <laughs> America is not responsible. The prince could have actually, you're mine. And two weeks later, now he's showing someone else around, right? That is my snake, that is my zebra, that is my Mexican, that is my tiger. He inside of some little box that says Jibril. But it never happened. And we're walking around, and I actually pulled him aside for a second. I said, listen, uh, I gotta tell you something. Well, you tell me. I, I need to apologize. What did you do? I didn't do anything. I just want to apologize for coming here with the wrong mentality. I says, unfortunately, I thought that, uh, just, you know, because it is the Middle East, I thought you guys were going to be rude, and everybody's been nothing but nice. Huh? I know. <laughs> I didn't think you guys were going to speak English so well and understand, you know, so many references, and you guys get everything. Huh? I know. <laughs> I thought you guys were going to throw rocks, but you were funny. What? Never mind. <laughs> All right, two out of three, why aren't <laughs> So we're walking, and uh, he's showing me this and that, and we're just kind of like looking around. I thought it was great, and then I saw something that freaked me out. We're walking in the direction of a giant cage, and when I saw the cage, I stopped. I was like, ah! Uh, what's with the cage? Take a look. Great. <laughs> So I walk over towards the cage and I look inside and I notice that there's birds in there. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, it's a bird cage. And he got all offended, you know. That's not regular birds. Those are falcons. I go, okay, well, you have a lot of falcons. Oh, well, you use the falcons for hunting. You hunt falcons? No, 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 no. Each falcon is very expensive. 100,000 US dollars. They are trained. We go out and we shoot a little animal and we send a falcon to retrieve. Would you like to see? No, 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 no. I got little dogs. I don't want <laughs> Bye. Before I know it, here comes the other guy. Please, please, please. And he goes inside the cage and he puts on this leather glove that comes up to his elbow and he starts getting one of the falcons. I'm watching him do this and I notice all the falcons are on these perches about this high and there's about 15 in a row. And they all have hoods covering their eyes. And I asked them, why do they have hoods on their eyes, man? They look like little hostages. 
sorry, bro. I'm sorry. I meant no disrespect by that, man. Seriously. No. No disrespect. I, it was a slip. And he was cool. I understand. Middle East hostage. <laughs> So the other guy comes out and he's got a falcon with him and he's got a glove and he hands me the glove and I put it on and he transfers his falcon to my arm. And uh, all of a sudden he starts doing snapping things and he's basically showing me that the falcon's trained. And I thought that was great. I thought we were gonna kill something. I'm like, no, but we were just playing with the falcon. And I started getting excited, you know? And the more excited I got, the more the prince started showing his age. Cause then he got excited. I'm like, this is great. It is great. Yes, this is so cool, so cool. Oh my God, you're so lucky to have so many falcons. I am so lucky. Would you like a falcon? <laughs> so matter of fact, like, would you like a cookie? Would you like a falcon? Same way. I'm like, are you kidding me? Don't give me a falcon that can retrieve things. Shoo, you think I'm lazy now? <laughs> Hell no, don't give me a, no, no, no. I wouldn't even leave the house. I'd be at the front door. <laughs> Donuts. <laughs> And who the hell is going to watch my falcon when I'm up here performing? I can't leave it with my buddy Martin in the back. You know he would abuse it, take it to some nightclub, try to hook up with it, freaking here. <laughs> the redhead. <laughs> After I performed in the Middle East, um, I had one of the longest flights of my life coming home. It's probably about a 26-hour trip, okay? We left out of Kuwait, and we had about four stops. It was long. When I got home, I was so tired, I, I turned on my phone to check my messages, and uh, I had a voicemail message from a guy by the name of Channing Tatum, okay? <laughs> Now, for those of you not wooing, let me explain who that is. Channing Tatum is the new Hollywood hot guy. He's the guy that comes out on all these movies, really good looking, ripped. You know, he's making a lot of films. And there's a voicemail on there from him. Game really glaces, this is Channing Tatum. Please call me at your earliest convenience, blah, 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 you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. So I call him up. You know, Hello. I go, hi, this is Gabriel Iglesias. I'm calling for Mr. Channing Tatum. He yells, Fluffy! <laughs> Hello? Oh, dude, man, I'm a huge fan. Hey, listen, bro, really quick, I only have like a minute. Look, bro, I'm doing a new movie, and I want to see if you're interested in reading and auditioning for one of the parts. I go, I go, sure, bro, I, I'd be happy to audition for, for uh, you know, for your movie. What's, what's it called? He goes, the movie's called Magic Mike. I was like, okay, Magic Mike, so you need a magician, you need an assistant, you want to saw me in half, what's going to happen? Actually, bro, the movie has nothing to do with magic. It's actually a movie about male strippers. I said, male strippers? He goes, yeah, male strippers. I said, you do know that this is Gabriel Iglesias, right? <laughs> he goes, you're funny, bro. Listen, we've already got the dancers, but we need somebody to play the DJ at the club. Will you audition for the part? I said, you know what, bro? I'm, I'll be there, okay? And just to let you guys know, because some people have asked me in the past, how come you're not in more movies? Because you have to audition. And I don't like auditions because they treat you like crap. Auditions are very cold and very just, they make you feel like They seriously do. You work really hard to memorize all your lines, and you show up, and you try to do your thing, and they cut you off really quick. You're in there, and you're like, um, okay, so who am I reading? Hold on. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll hold on. Hey, how's it going? Don't talk to him. All right, no problem. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Um, quick question. How much energy do you want? You don't know? Um, that's why I'm asking. Uh, <laughs> and when you're done, you try to ask him more questions. Like, is this okay? Would you like me to go again? Thank you. They, I've had my, the fingers this so many times and it hurts thank you thank you thank you and you're sitting in your car and you're crying <laughs> they don't like me it's a terrible feeling so i don't like putting myself through that but since i got a phone call from the guy i'm like all right i hope it's a little bit different so i show up to the audition i'm sitting in the lobby and it's funny because anytime there's an audition Everybody at the audition, usually they're looking for a specific type. And so everybody that's sitting there with me looks just like me. <laughs> everybody in there is big, everybody's sitting there, everybody's all happy and jolly and stuff. And we're all looking at each other, trying to outdo each other. Like, no, I look more like me than you do. You don't look like me. No, this is what they want. No, this is what they want. You know? <laughs> 
So the receptionist looks at me. She goes, Mr. Iglesias, they'll see you now. And I'm like, okay, cool. Here we go. Let's, let's see how this goes. So I start mentally preparing myself for the, you know, the problems that happen in there. I walk in. I don't say anything to anyone. I walk in. There's three people in the room. I close the door. And I just look over at the casting person who's sitting on her desk. And I, hello. And her, the camera person, and the person I'm reading with all jumped up and yelled, Fluffy! And they ran over to me and they started hugging me and pulling out camera phones. Now I'm taking pictures with them. Next thing I know, they call a receptionist. Judy, get in here. And girl comes in. Now I'm taking pictures with four women. We're going back and forth. I'm like, this is different. <laughs> you know? And I go, wow, you know, this is very refreshing. Thank you. I says, who am I reading my part with? And the casting person says, this is a formality. They've always wanted you for the part. And they said, if you show it up, it's yours. So basically, we've already called your agent since you showed up. Really? Yeah, this is great. So I, I get to my car. My agent is blowing up my phone, right? And I answer the phone. I go, hello. He's like, dude, you nailed that audition. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm on the set of the movie Magic Mike. The movie is directed by a, a director named Steven Soderbergh, who's an amazing, amazing director. He's done a lot of great films. And of course, Channing Tatum's in the movie. In addition to him, there's an actor by the name of Matthew McConaughey who's attached to the movie. I'm a huge fan of Matthew McConaughey, okay? When I found out I was gonna work with him, I was so excited. You know, and people say, really, you get excited? You get starstruck? Hell yeah, <laughs> I'm a comedian, not an actor. <laughs> so I show up, and immediately they send me to the makeup trailer that's parked outside. So I go inside the makeup trailer, I sit down, they start working on my hair, they start putting makeup on me, and in comes Matthew McConaughey, and he sits down in the chair next to me, and I start freaking out. I'm like, oh my goodness, Matthew McConaughey. Oh my goodness. And now, I, I decide to introduce myself before I did or said something stupid, right? So I look over at him, and I say, excuse me, Mr. McConaughey, how you doing? My name is Gabriel Iglesias. I'm going to be playing the part of Tobias, the club DJ, and I just wanted to say hello, and it's an honor to work with you. And in my head, I'm like, I hope he's the same guy. I hope he's the same person from the movies. I hope his voice is the same. I hope his accent's the same. And he looks at me and he says, all right. <laughs> How you doing there, big man? You doing good? I'm doing good. All right. And I'm spazzing out. <laughs> and they pull my ass out of the trailer and they take me onto the set. And... Uh, the majority of the shots in the movie Magic Mike are shot inside of a strip club, okay? It's on a stage, and I'm very comfortable up here. But the cool part for me is I'm on the side of the stage inside of a DJ booth, so I don't have any worries. The director comes up to me and he says, Listen, Gabe, you got all your speaking roles in the film, but in addition to that, you are the key background in every shot when it comes to the dancers. He goes... The guy on stage is the eye candy, but you're the guy that provides the ear candy and you need to express yourself and give me energy. Can you do that? Yes, sir. Let's do this. Next thing I know. All right, everybody, here we go. And quiet on the set. Hey, and action. All of a sudden, the dancing. <laughs> Dancer comes out, camera starts panning just like that one, right? And all of a sudden, I'm in my DJ booth and I start DJing it up. <laughs> The director comes out from behind the camera, crosses the stage, and gets in my face. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Give me more. Like, okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Quiet on the set. And action. <laughs> and I take off. The movie comes out. I attend the screening of the film with my girlfriend at Warner Brothers Studios. We're sitting there and we're waiting for that part to come up. And I tell her, baby, it's coming, it's coming, watch. Sure enough, the camera starts panning. And you see the dancer, you can't even see his head. All you see is his body all freaking ripped and moving. And in the background, in the DJ booth, you cannot see any of the DJ equipment because it's all below the line of the camera. All you see in the background is some chubby pervert in a box having the time of his life.
And my girlfriend's like, oh, you're gay. I guess so. There was a couple of other things that happened in this movie that I got to share because you're never going to hear about them in a DVD bonus feature. One of the characters in the movie, his name in the movie is Big <laughs> Richie. I'll leave it at that. He's played by an actor named Joe. Joe's, Joe's a cool guy, cool guy. I, I met him out, you know, uh, we became buddies after the movie and uh, nice guy. He's big, he's ripped, okay? And his whole thing is he comes out on stage and he's dancing behind a silhouette. So all you see is the shadow of him dancing for three minutes. And after the third minute, he grabs his G-string, and this is how he finishes his performance. He tears it off, exposing a shadow of, you know. <laughs> now in real life, Joe does not possess. You know, rawr. Don't laugh too hard, that's most of us, okay? Now, because they needed to make this scene happen and we're shooting it in Hollywood, they made a phone call to an adult film company that was up the street and they got a hold of their props department and they said basically, you know, what we need is about 45 impressive male rubber parts to be brought down to the set of the movie Magic Mike so we can attach one of them to an actor for a scene. It took maybe 30 minutes for some guy to show up with a big trunk on the set. And you could just tell he did not belong. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Channing Tatum saw him and he goes, are you the guy? I'm the guy. And he brought him inside the house, and he got all the actors around the kitchen table, and he told the guy, he says, listen, bro, dump it out right here, all of it. And the guy opens up the trunk, and he dumps out all of these big freaking, you know, it made a mountain. <laughs> and all the actors were just standing there, just staring, like, oh, my God. All of a sudden, the 12-year-old came out of all of us, because we all grabbed one and started playing Star Wars, just... <laughs> Another thing I got to share about this experience doing the movie Magic Mike is that uh, we shot it in two locations. We shot it in Hollywood and we shot it in um, Orlando, no, no, not Orlando, Tampa, Florida. And one of the scenes was shot on a sandbar, which most of you know already is a little tiny island with nothing on it. It's a little real small and people go there and they party. And so we get to this little island and uh, this guy with the headphones, his title is PA, personal assistant, the director, and he comes over and he tells us, listen guys, we're gonna be here for a couple of hours. If you need to use the facilities, these are your options. There's no plumbing here. You can either go in the water or you can go to those bushes over there. It's up to you. And I'm like, I'm fine, I already went. Two hours, no problem. Four hours later. What do you need? Listen, bro, you guys said we were only gonna be here for like two hours. It's going on five, my stomach is killing me. What's the story? We're gonna be here for like another three. The director has some more shots. Oh, you have your options, thanks. So the first thing I look at is the water, okay? And to put it into perspective for you guys, the water's like right there, okay? And all the actors are like, like, like right there, okay? <laughs> So I was like, are you kidding me? I'm not gonna go pop a squat in the water in front of all those actors just so somebody can walk by and go, Fluffy's killing fishes. <laughs> so I take a stroll out to the bushes, right? So I start walking out to the bushes, my stomach is killing me. And fortunately, by the time I got there, my stomach had settled. So I no longer had to go number two. But since I was there, you know, <laughs> go make it rain, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So I'm in the bushes and I'm doing my thing and all of a sudden I start hearing noises. Just and you know how you could just feel when somebody is standing like right next to you? And I couldn't turn around because you know I was doing my thing. All of a sudden I see a shadow. A long shadow. And it's coming in my direction. And I see that and I'm like, ha ha, funny Joe, that's funny. 
all of a sudden that shadow started to pee. And I was like, oh my God, it's real. Now curiosity has me. I gotta find out who the hell the owner. So really quick, I'm just like, you know, 